everything around you has been designed. Well, may, maybe not the people sitting next to you, although we can't be sure about that yet. <laughs> but we do live in a designed world, um, particularly in this, this, this part of the geographical uh, world. Uh, most of what we uh, encounter has been designed by somebody somewhere whom we may never even meet. So the clothes that you're wearing, the seats that you're sitting in, this room, the building, they've all come about through decisions made by people somewhere else who think they know what it is that we need. And there's a kind of relationship then between designers and um, us as users where we are a pretty diverse lot. Of course, the designers are too, but they all dress in black, so we know that. <laughs> um, and the designers have intentions about how, how best uh, the world can be constructed or uh, how to impose order on the world so that it benefits us as the users. And then we have behaviors that we engage in. We have activities that we do that um, hopefully align with the designer's intentions. But they don't always align with the uh, designer's intentions. Now, my particular interest is in um, being in a school of architecture is in how buildings meet the expectations and meet the needs of the various people who, who, who use the building. And it's very often, uh, the quote that's very often used in this is uh, one from uh, Winston Churchill, which said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Now, that is fairly obviously the case since there are only certain things that you can do in buildings. You can't walk through walls. So they do, of course, have some impact on how we use them. But I think probably the more interesting thing for me is what happens when the behaviors are misaligned, when they don't uh, line up with the intentions of the designers. And that's where you start to see really interesting things. You start to see how people maybe subvert what the designers intended. There are some um, fairly uh, obvious examples of this. Um, you know, we don't always follow the paths that people have laid out for us, and we create what are known as desire lines, and desire is an important word in this. And we don't always um, sit where we're supposed to sit. Uh, and I don't know why that is the case, but it might be something to do with the color, I don't know. But these seats obviously were not uh, so attractive uh, to the people um, who, were, who were in that building. So this misalignment of design intentions and what people actually do in buildings has become a bit of a fascination of mine. And I think that Churchill, you know, if he hadn't been distracted by other things in 1941, <laughs> he probably would have said, uh, we shape uh, our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. And then we reshape them right back at you you know, in Churchillian words, of course. So this misalignment, I think, is um, particularly uh, of interest. Now, the relationship um, between uh, designers and their clients is uh, one full of wonderful tales of, of misalignment uh, and of interaction between, in the case of buildings, architects, and the clients and the users that they, they, they serve. There's a great story about Frank Lloyd Wright <coughs> that fantastic American uh, architect who has, of course, roots in, in, in Wales, West Wales. Frank Lloyd Wright apparently um, was very obsessive about the details of his buildings. And he had prescribed within his designs uh, the layouts of the furniture. So apparently Frank and his wife, uh, Olga Vanna, went to visit some friends one evening in their home. Uh, the friends went out for the evening, leaving uh, the rights uh, on their own within the, uh, within the home. And they thought as a gift to their friends that they would rearrange the furniture, <laughs> which they did, and then included moving uh, a grand piano around. And they were exhausted, and, um, but they felt that they had arrived at a much more harmonious um, arrangement of, of the furniture. Of course, the couple came back, and they were horrified. And they spent the whole night reverting the layer of the furniture to uh, the way it had been and the way that they preferred it to be. 
So that's a, a really good example of how uh, good intentions on the part of an architect sometimes don't uh, result uh, in, in satisfaction for their clients or, or the users of the building. The slightly depressing thing is that at least Frank was involved with his clients, at least he got engaged with them. But uh, in a recent survey um, carried out by the Architects' Journal, it revealed that only 3% of architects in the UK <clears throat> carry out what we call post-occupancy evaluations, that they go back and look at how people use the houses that they have designed. So if you, if you don't go and see what people do with your buildings, how do, you, how do you design buildings in such a way that it will meet the requirements of, of, of the people that, you, that are going to use them? Well, the starting point for this is uh, very often, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this diagram of uh, Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. Um, there are many different versions of this, uh, and to some extent it is being, has been critiqued uh, in many different ways as being uh, unreliable and, and, and inaccurate. But still, it, 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 it does serve one function of, of uh, identifying what are basic needs and then maybe what are called the being needs, the, the ones in black at the top of the pyramid. As long as the, um, the, the ones in white are satisfied, then the organism, the human, will survive. And of course, the being needs at the top are what makes life pleasurable and what makes, um, you know, what makes us uh, want to carry on. And in fact, the being needs at the top, you can never get enough of them. You can never have enough justice. You can never have enough uh, beauty and so on. So that's a useful distinction to be made. This version, I think, dates back to 1964. Um, when I was looking to, uh, trying to find the most recent version of it, I did find some uh, examples where learned scholars uh, on the internet had actually uh, found uh, some more basic needs than the ones at the very bottom of this, and that was the first one <laughs> that I found. And then, about a couple of hours later, I came up with my own uh, addition to this, which was that one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, there's, the, there's still... There are needs that, 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 we, that emerge as we, we, we uh, evolve in our societies. But the other thing, or the most important thing that I want to suggest to you is that it's not just about needs. If we're designing just for, about needs, then it's not, it's not going to work. Nobody needs a smartphone, but that's what everybody wants. So alongside this uh, pyramid of needs, I have an inverted pyramid of wants. I haven't put any detail into it. But this does have... If you look at what people want, it's probably a better predictor of their behavior than what the basic needs are. And you can see that in that people will do anything for free Wi-Fi, apparently, uh, and will put themselves uh, out to, to, to access what is a want rather than a need. And in fact, Henry Petrowski, uh, I think very uh, cogently, suggested that in fact luxury is the mother of invention, not necessarily uh, necessity. It's not just about what, what uh, people need. So you might say, well, um, you know, why is this important? Why, why, why should we worry about misaligned, uh, you know, a misalignment between uh, intentions and behaviors? Um, and just to reinforce that in buildings, the wants often determine what we do. Uh, nobody needs a ski slope in Dubai. Uh, where it's minus six inside and uh, 40 degrees C probably outside, but sub somebody obviously wanted it badly enough uh, to pay for a building that could sustain that kind of temperature difference and could, uh, would have an air conditioning or a cooling plant that would maintain that difference. So that's an, ex an extreme example of a want. But there are other wants that uh, people have that are much less extreme, but nonetheless uh, more important. Some of the work we've been doing uh, in the Welsh School of Architecture has been looking at how people respond to thermal environments in their own homes. Uh, and, and we've gone out there into uh, various people's homes and we've looked at what they actually do rather than based on some theoretical studies of what people do in laboratories. Now, I know in TED Talks, you're supposed, every slide's supposed to be cool. It's supposed to look, you know, really uh, jazzy. And uh, so I, please, you might be shocked by these. These are not these are not cool, so I just warn you about that. This is somebody's conservatory. And, um, you know, it, it, it highlights it wonderfully. 
they like the conservatory because they can see out into the garden and so on. But it's cold, so they stick in a fan heater to keep them warm so they can still enjoy the views. And in another case, uh, it, they want it all year round. So not only have they got a gas heater, they've also got a fan to cool them down uh, in the summer. So as an example of how wants can override what uh, you might think that people would need, which would be to reduce their energy consumption, to save money by doing so, they're actually prepared to, um, to spend more to be able to access the views from uh, their conservatories. Are there any architects in the audience watching that? They probably, they probably fainted by now. They? I, I, I don't know, we can, we can sort that out later. So what, what we found really is that, in fact, the pursuit of desired thermal experiences <laughs> trumps everything else. So get me to the beach or get me into the sauna. I don't care how much it costs, I'm going there. And that's, that's what we find in people's homes. The technical and the standard um, approach to this is, the engineering approach is, well, they'll have to stop doing that, you know. Um, and that's why we have this massive um, program of behavior change, which I'm really uncomfortable with because it's people, uh, technocratic people saying, well, they're going to have to change their behaviors, you know, because we say so. And my argument is that if you don't take into consideration what people want when you're designing, whether it's a full building or whether it's an energy policy, whether it's a, an energy upgrade scheme, if you don't take the wants into consideration, then it's likely to be subverted when you roll it out. It's likely to fail. And that's what's really important. OK, uh, now I'm going to... Um, introduce an idea which I have found very useful uh, and which I've become increasingly interested in. Again, this, this may shock. Um, I'm interested in dirt. Uh, I'm not going to talk dirty, but I'm going to talk about dirt. <laughs> dirt is a concept that uh, was uh, developed by uh, an anthropologist called Mary Douglas. And she used the term dirt to refer to um, things that are out of place. Matter out of place was her exact phrase things that are anomalous, that don't fit in with the order that has been imposed. And design, in a strong sense, is order that is imposed on people. So dirt is an inevitable consequence of design. It just happens. If you design something, if you impose structure on something, you will get dirt. It's inevitable. What I'm trying to persuade you, and this is a, this is a tough sell, I'm trying to persuade you that dirt can be good. Think of it like soil that you can grow things in. And that's very often what happens with matter out of place, with things out of place. They help us create new things, and they, 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 they prompt us to uh, change our way of doing things. So dirt is inevitable. And there are good and bad examples of dirt, of course. Um, dirt can be a response to some uh, design uh, inadequacy, <coughs> which... Uh, would be um, in, a, in a safety context. And we wouldn't want that to stay. Uh, but obviously, it's highlight, highlighting a, a difference between the design intentions and what the behavior of the building should be. So we end up with a situation where, uh, going back to the earlier slide, where there are misaligned uh, behaviors and misaligned uh, intentions. But in this case, what I'm arguing is that they need to, uh, they need to engage. They need to uh, connect with each other in some way. And I'm arguing, uh, again, tough sell, that dirt can be good for us because it suggests engagement with what we're actually doing rather than a passive acceptance and rather than being uh, unconcerned about what, uh, how a, a design meets our needs. Uh, and I love this example. Um, where somebody's actually engaged with a, a derelict building and highlighted uh, its, its actual plight by using uh, <coughs> a bit of graffiti. I'm not advocating graffiti, by the way. <coughs> and, and harking back to the previous speaker, um, schools and school children are wonderful at, at using buildings in ways that they weren't intended to be used. So, you know, if we allow... Um, people to 
interact with buildings in ways that weren't intended, then we can have some real, real benefits from that. And when I was researching this talk, I came, up, I came across a previous uh, TED speaker at uh, TED Global, um, <clears throat> the architect Alejandro uh, Aravena, who has a practice called Elemental in Chile. And what his practice has been doing, I think, is uh, a good example of how he's made space for what I would call dirt, how he's made space for people to do things that aren't in the plan. Not everything is scripted. Things can uh, happen spontaneously. And he's done this primarily to uh, create affordable housing. But I think it sends out a, a good message that you know, architects shouldn't over-prescribe what, what they're designing. They should leave some space for people to do things. And his, um, his example is uh, some housing here. And there are several of these schemes. This is one of them. This is uh, Via Verde uh, in Chile, uh, where he's, he's only built half the house. So he's allowed, um, he's allowed the occupants, uh, the homeowners, to fill the other space whenever, um, whenever they can afford to and whenever they want to. So he's, he's actually making room uh, for some dirt in there. And we can also learn um, uh, from um, other uh, animals uh, which are not so uh, precious about uh, our designs and how to take advantage of structures that we put in. And by doing so, it very often gives uh, places a very distinctive local character. This is Alcala de Henares in Spain, and there are lots of these stork nests all over uh, this town, and it is actually a, a really, really wonderful place to go because the storks are, that they have found something there that attracts them. And of course, the town allows them to do this because uh, it attracts people to see them. So really, my argument has been that um, design creates dirt. It's inevitable. I think to some extent it's desirable. Uh, and that I would uh, hope that um, we all can uh, accept dirt for being what it is. And maybe, as a youngest child knows, learn to have some fun and play with it.